Welcome into 316 Soccer Show, the second episode here. Before this, it was a radio show, and now we've evolved into something more. We're coming to you now here from Emerson Biggins. We thank them, thank Service Body Shop, and all the other people that have supported us and have got us here to this point on the 316 Soccer Show. This show will be, we're going to focus on all levels. We're going to do international soccer down to, you know, local soccer, Sporting KC, MLS, and of course, Wichita Wings, lots of Wichita Wings, some good guests coming up for you here after a while. Then we'll do college soccer. Of course, we got Cliff Brown here, Newman University head men's coach, and uh, then we'll get all the way down to the youth level as well. And quick introductions, I am Peter Espinosa, radio voice of the Wichita Wings. Like I say, Cliff Brown, former Wichita Wing and the head coach of the Newman University men's team, Blake Shoemaker owner of Service Body Shop and the president and founder of the Wichita Wings Youth Soccer Academy. Like I said, all kinds of soccer, and let's get right into it. First things first, Wings. We all just got back from the Sprint Center in Kansas City, Missouri, where the Wings took on the Missouri Comets for the sixth and final time this season. The series ended up 4-2, but we ended on a good note. Win 10-9 off of Kevin Tenike. Beautiful goal. Blake, you and I were there. Great venue. Besides, the turf was a little... A little unsure, a little sketchy, but great venue, great win for the Wings, great performance. Yeah, absolutely. We, we may get into the turf a little bit later. Uh, LeBaron pregame was out there a few hours before the game, walking around. He had all the officials. If you worked for the Sprint Center, the Comets, or were an official, LeBaron had you in a huddle, and they were trying to figure out the turf. Uh, we'll get with him later and figure out why, why they never got that addressed. Um, yeah, the, the turnout was great. There was a ton of Wings fans. I'm sure most people have seen exactly uh, Facebook and Twitter and everything that's blowing up with the Wings right now, talking about the fan support, the Orange Army. Uh, the players have recognized it, most importantly, is that now, now these guys go out and they, they really want to win for the fan support. Great to travel there, great win. This series could easily be 5-1 and one Wichita right now. So, uh, but big win. We're even in, the, even in the loss column with some games in hand going into this weekend. And it was a game, it was a, it was a fun game to watch, especially when I was you know, broadcasting the game, because besides after Freddie Mugin went up to uh, uh, score the goal to go up 2-0 for the Wings, after that it, it was never more than a one-point game. So it was always in the balance. Both teams were, towards the end of the first half, it seemed to get a little bit more physical, and I was expecting it to get even worse in the second half, but it didn't. I think both teams kind of began to focus on the main goal, which was scoring and, you know, bringing that lead and, you know, getting a stronghold in the game rather than, you know, you know, the, the shirt tugging, be, you know, it stopped, everything stopped, you know, it remained physical, but I kind of expected it to get a little bit more, but um, moving on to a few players who played well, Fausto, a player who hadn't played in over seven games. Did well to stretch, stretch Kansas City, let, it, let Sinaldo play balls into his feet and kind of get it, get it started from the back and, instead of trying to control with two defenders and Sinaldo. That, that gets a little bit intimidating for a keeper standpoint, I assume, because you're always possessing out of the back and all they're doing is pressing three guys forward. So at some point, you've got to stretch the field and get everybody clear out. And, you know, uh, his problem at the beginning of the year, he was one of, the, one of the last ones to be signed by the team, was his fitness. He looked a little bit out of shape, but he looked better in this game by far. His best game, he scored his first goal, and, he, uh, you know, he looked much better. And another player, Danny Villegas, he, of course, missed a lot of time with injuries but once again, got on the score sheet here. Got his first three points, had a goal and an assist. And in the first two games, Cliff, you know, we talked about the two games he played fully. He looked very, very good. And since then, it's taken him a little while to get back to 100%. He's almost there, but it's been, it, it, you know, it's hurt him because he's not at 100% and he can't play at the level he wants to. But getting on the score sheet on Saturday really helped him out, and he's close to 100%, isn't he? Yeah, and it's always, it's always a process to come back from an, an injury. You know, the team has been playing. They've, got, they've established a rhythm. They've got their lines, and now he's got to come in, but not only come in after sitting out for a long time, but he's carrying that leg brace. His timing is off. He's got to adjust his body. There's a lot of things to, uh, to, to accommodate for, and I think he's done very, very well. I mean, the very first game back, we talked about it. We thought he was very dangerous. He, he really helped the team, but you could tell he was lumbering at times, and, and his fitness wasn't up. But he looked so much sharper in this game. I didn't have the advantage of being at the game like these two gentlemen, so I watched it online, and I actually watched it on my, my uh, your, smartphone. Your cell phone. Yeah. Uh, my <laughs> smartphone. Technology is a great thing now. That MIS cell what. feed is never, but I, but it's I'll never tell you what, what, it's never what it, it says was. A, it was a great picture. It really was. Yeah. And it was very easy to watch. The only thing that was difficult sometimes to tell who was on the lines, the announcers weren't really keeping up on it, and it was very difficult for me to tell exactly who was on, on, on the pitch all the time. But it was still a great game to watch, and I, re I, I thoroughly enjoyed it with what? There must have been seven lead changes. I know at one point there were five, and there were at least two more lead changes after that, I'm pretty sure. 
Yeah, I think so, every goal nine, was a lead nine, change. Nine, not every, every, every goal was a lead change. change. Well, yeah. Got the game well, after, after the three-point took two goals. After the three-point, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that kind of consumed us, too, to yeah. the point where, you know, yeah, but, here we go again. But We're nine developing a little changes. bit of rivalry. And, and guys, on that three-pointer, we'll talk to Sinaldo here in a minute, Jason probably handled. Yeah. And Sinaldo was, he, when he was talking to the referee, he was convinced that Jason handled. Well, Sinaldo handled, too. And don't forget, so we, we'll we, talk about more than once. <laughs> don't, but don't forget, you know, there's a good chance that Brian Cushing, I'd like to look at the video again, that his may have been a three-point three as well, point, that the referees right. missed that one. But for and the it's Wayne's, a second three-pointer yeah. in, this, in, in as many weeks that they missed for us. Tajani's, Dr. LeBaron, he said Tajani's was a three-pointer yeah. last week at home as well. Right. And that would have yeah. changed the game drastically. And that was another player that played very well for us this game was Brian Cushing. I thought he had a yeah. really, really strong performance. We didn't see him until the second quarter, but he right. came on and immediately he, you know, like you've talked about before, he's so efficient he with his shifts so and his time out there. His, yeah. shifts are, his shifts are as quick as anybody shift on the team. If he doesn't get something, he doesn't make bad substitutions. When you get caught in a situation with Brian, there's been multiple times this year where the wings have been caught in bad substitution. Every team has it, but a bench warning for substitutions or a two-minute penalty for, for substitutions. Or giving the ball away. Or giving it away and, and creating an advantage the other way. Yeah. Brian really doesn't hurt you like that. Yeah. He gives you a 30, 45 seconds, sometimes less than that, that are quality. And, again, his minutes-to-goal ratio are as good as anybody's on the team at this point. But and back to, back to Dan, Danny real quick, Vegas. He hasn't got forward a lot. Uh, Danny came through tryouts. Came into Wichita. May, LeBaron looked at him for an hour and had him sign, had a deal signed with him. So he didn't even have to go to the next days. Uh, Danny came in. He got forward a lot. He was a defender from the get go, but he was always getting forward. He's got a quality shot. He's got a good touch, and he can be a big part of our attack. I believe the only problem uh, has been his lateral movement with his knee. So this was the first time since he's been back we've seen him get forward. And and don't forget to uh, give Brian Perez some credit on that ball. Brian dropped the ball in oh, from a dime amazing, from three quarters pass. of the pitch away. Yeah, drops it right on pass. his foot. And my goodness, what a, what a ball. Danny takes yeah. it down well and finishes. So, yeah, it was a, that was a great effort for Danny. And Cushing's goal, besides Ten Eich's goal, the winning goal, Cushing's goal was my favorite because I think it was an intended pass, and it took maybe a slight deflection yeah. and just kind of went across Waltman. He just watched it go across him into the back of his net. Is I... I'm not sure if it was a left-footed shot from the left side. So he's, he was having trouble tracking balls from that side. Waltman was the same place, uh, close to the same place that Tenike scored from. Yeah, and so. a, a almost exact place uh, Tenike scored from. Now, to wrap things up, the Tenike goal, you know, he, as a rookie, he's had a great season. He got his, that, that was his 14th and 15th point, that goal. And you and I were debating what to call the goal, whether, <laughs> whether it was a tabletop or a, or a bicycle it's kick a, or something. A flying side volley. But I think a he flying, flying side volley. Yes, yes, but but, can be but I think, I think he, the mount that he spun, we're going to coin a phrase. He did a saucer. It was a flying side volley. To make it simple, but yeah. absolutely right. That's it was a flying side volley, a tabletop, a table volley, whatever you want to call well, it. Well, a table, you can still have a foot on the ground, though. Yeah, he did. He, he Both was in the air. There. He tracks the ball. And again, uh, you know, we spoke with Sinaldo off the uh, pre-show a little bit, and he was talking about the one where he handballed. The ball comes up. He, he's going to come out and play it with his feet, but the turf was so tall, a foot and a half tall against those boards, that it actually flies. The balls are playing up in the air over it. Guy. So how he misplayed that, same thing with Kevin, only he tracked it back to the goal, follows the ball yeah. all the way around, and both Un feet in the air. Goal. Yeah, uh, to track it is one thing. To even bring it down is difficult, but to, to put it on goal and finish was amazing. So Ten Eich scores the winner. Anything, anything else we need to mention about the game that weekend? The National Coaches Convention was there. Blake, you attended, talked to a few people. Was it a, was it a the good coaches convention? convention uh, coaches Convention, from, from, a, from a different side of things, um, from the youth standpoint, I noticed a lot of what they were talking about. The academies typically, and we can ask LeBaron, he may know a little bit more with his son DeBray playing uh, for the Sporting Kansas City Juniors about how the academies run right now. But uh, a lot of them are U12 and up for these MLS academies, Cliff. And the, the thing about that is, these guys, I talked to a couple guys uh, in conversations in a group with Ralph Salt Lake Academy, a guy that guy that's one of the heads of their academy, uh, LA Galaxy, Colorado Rapids, and I believe somebody from the New York Red Bulls were together talking about not necessarily US, USU soccer curriculum and saying, hey, this is how we're going to do it, but they were saying our. What are we going to do with our seven, Correct. eight, nines, and tens? Correct. And, and that's the thing is they were starting to talk about getting curriculum together, MLS academy type curriculum from seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven pre-academy because they're not competing until they're U12, but they're ready to start bringing in younger players and training them, and that was the biggest thing that caught my eye at the convention. And it's going to happen quickly. Originally, the academies were just the two older, older divisions, what you were required to carry, and they they built them on down very quickly, yeah. and it's had a big impact on youth soccer. Yeah. It was a big part of what they were talking about in front of me, and, and I love that because, you know, I'm a big youth mm -hmm. soccer guy, and I, 
I, uh, that's my thing is let's get them four, five, six, seven years old and train them and, and let's turn them into a player. That way we can get them in front of the right people when they're 12, 13 and try to, try to get a kid in the right place. And that convention is, is, is really an unbelievable uh, event. I've been to it many, many times. And you have to realize that the National Soccer Coaches Association is the largest coaching association in, in the United States of any sport. And they come together once a year like that. And there's, there's uh, clinics and meetings. And NCAA meetings are there, NEI meetings and junior colleges. There's presentations. It's just a huge event through the whole week. And it's, it's uh, a great learning experience, but it's also a great network. Working. Yeah, it, it, it was it, networking's great. There's some of the guys that were there were totally, they weren't coaches, they were internet trainers. And you know, you can go to YouTube and find so many internet videos and everybody's selling you a video. If, uh, if you have a kid that plays soccer, you play soccer in the league, odds are your email is getting, they've got your email address and it's not just are you getting it from the sports owner SESA, but you're getting emails from these coaches. And the guys that, that do these videos were there also, so that was pretty informative. I had a good time with it and, uh, and the biggest thing now, Wichita, a lot of the fans are like, hey, that was a great atmosphere. There was a coaches convention. Uh, the Wings got a win at the Sprint Center, which is a great venue. But a lot of the banter I'm seeing on like Twitter and Facebook and this is, hey, let's get that coaches convention in Wichita. Just so everybody knows, it's not that easy. It's a national coaches yeah. convention. There's people from all over the world there. It's, it, you've got to bid for it years in advance. It's not an overnight thing. And Wichita is not exactly, at this point, the soccer venue that's going to have that. Well, but we, we could. I don't, think we, I don't think we have the facilities for it yet, yeah. though, and, either. The yeah, well, our, convention center, our, our convention center is a little bit short. I mean, you got to understand the number of fields and areas they have set up that they're doing. They're doing s sessions, Yeah. OK, where they have players on the floor, coaching the floor. They're doing shooting. They're doing all kinds. And there's building after uh, room after room after room that they're doing these in. And I'm not sure that we quite have the, the infrastructure to support it at this time. All right, so a weekend full of soccer for the Wings and for the nation with the Coaches Convention in town. Uh, wings win 10-9. Uh, they're 5-8. and eight. Uh, Comets 9-8. and eight, But the Wings still have four games in hand. And we'll talk more about the Wings, that game, and what's left for the rest of the season. Coming up next here, LeBaron Holloman is in the building, and we'll speak to him next here on 316 Soccer Show.